Hello once again, folks. Uh, welcome back to AP Literature Discussions with my friend Ben Magaziner about uh, Brothers Karamazov. Hi, this is Ben. Um, last time we did the Rebellion chapter, this time we're going to attempt the Grand Inquisitor, which is probably um, a bigger topic to tackle. Uh, maybe it'll take two videos, as Ben was just saying beforehand. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. Um, so, Benjamin. Quick recap, right? Such in rebellion. Ivan was making this case that existence was ethically unjustified because it relied on the suffering of innocence, even if at some point there'd be some sort of heavenly paradise for everybody, it wasn't worth the price of the suffering of innocence. And he backed Alyosha into a corner. Alyosha seemed to agree. I haven't baited him into bringing up Jesus because he definitely had this Grand Inquisitor story locked and loaded, ready uh, to tell Alyosha. And that's what this chapter is, right? So the framing of it's very interesting. It's Ivan, so it's Dostoevsky writing through Ivan's character, telling a poem Ivan concocted in his head to Alyosha. Um, so the frame is very, is very crazy going on here. So, because the story will stop at certain points and Ivan and Alyosha will start talking and then they'll back off, it goes back into the story. Um, so just like we did last time, what was your, your initial thought about how the sort of chapter started? I thought it was really interesting how the first, the first thing that he did after such a, a scaled frame of argument was to go all the way to the bottom. I think he achieved that right away because he takes the, the, the Christ segue into um, like when the, when the hook really sets, um, uh, where is it? You just said now, is there a being in the whole world who would have the right to forgive and could forgive? But there is a being and he can forgive everything, all and for all, because he gave his innocent blood for all, yada, yada, yada. Because he is an innocent who suffered, therefore he has the, the standing, right, in right. the legal sense to forgive, right? That's how Yosha's response, yeah. And I, I think what he is saying here, or the subtext, and this might be my projection, but when he says, <laughs> but there is a being, what he is saying is, but there is being. And okay. this, this, is the, this is the link into what he's effectively saying is the metaphysical substrate, mm -hmm. which is like uh, that a sacrifice of some kind had to be made in an, from an even further scaled back perspective for zero to go to one, right? For there to be anything to exist on you know, the substrate that anything is built upon, that there is anything at all, there right. had to be sacrifice, which, right. which splits the, the heavenly bread and the earthly bread, right. which is kind of the next, you know, division of, of thinking here. Right. Um, and yeah, the, the way that he introduces that kind of is like the context that we're the most intelligent, uh, complicated being in this context, humankind. Yeah. And that, that we like, we still need to be met on our level of intelligence. That like, there has to be some kind of offering that can, um, that can be met against the scale of like earthly pleasure and earthly requirements, you yeah. know, of actual physical bread. Yeah. Um, so this distinction of, of sort of types of intelligence beginning at the at the outset, it's like, oh God, I'm gonna ha I know I'm gonna have to hold this through the whole chapter. Right. Yeah, so I think these different types of intelligences, where is, it's at the end of Rebellion, I'm looking for a quote. Um, it's about not understanding, like wanting to stick to the fact. Oh, here we go, I found it. Um, so this is Ivan talking at, in the end of Rebellion. Yeah. Um, I understand nothing, Ivan went on, as though in delirium. I don't want to understand anything now. I want to stick to the fact. 
I made up my mind long ago not to understand. If I try to understand anything, I shall be false to the fact. And I've determined to stick to the fact. Right? So this is the game Ivan's playing to some extent. And the, the problem where he's, he's hit a wall. Right? As far as his reason can take him, he, he can't reconcile the perceived immorality of existence with, with the facts on the ground. So he has a choice. He can either understand and accept what is, but then he would have to lie to himself, he's saying, mm -hmm. about, give up the facts, or I can stick to the facts and admit that I don't understand. Like, I don't understand how this is justified, right? Um, but I think that might be what you're talking about because now we have this split to some extent. We have human understanding, the limits of human reason. And then if existence is to be justified, the answer must be beyond that limit. Correct. Right, in the not irrational, but post-rational, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, I, I see it as sort of the, it's like the suggestion of, of new age thinking in here, yeah. right? It's sort of like the subtext for, uh, for Enya, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, idea, this transcendence, with, which the new age types seem to, perceive possibly rightly exists but they have no concept of what it might consist of there's no right. facts on the ground <laughs> no facts on the ground. Yeah. yeah it's understanding without the facts ivan is talking like i want to be pure science yeah. all facts but no narrative or no no mythos to tie it together yeah you can't figure out how it's justified right so then he goes into the grand inquisitor story right and I'm realizing that I, we should give some context once again for the students who may or may not be watching. Um, the Grand Inquisitor is a poem that Ivan has created in his head. He claims that he's been thinking of it for a long time. And this is the first time he's ever recited it. Although you can make the argument that it seems like some elements of it he's sort of improvising on the spot. Because um, it does mirror to some extent the conversation with Alyosha in a way that we can maybe get to. Um, so the, the poem story that he tells is of Christ coming back to earth during the Spanish Inquisition. And right away, and tell me if you pick this up then, it starts off very slow, right? He sort of goes into this literary history, how in that time period, it was common for there to be supernatural beings. There are all sorts of stories with Mary and plays with Mary and Jesus and all sorts of gods and stuff. So this was not weird. It was normal for the genre of the time. Then he has the returned Christ perform a bunch of miracles right off the bat. Now, I think that's so that anyone listening to the poem dispels immediately any sort of doubt that this is Christ, right? That, was that ever a question in your mind in the story that we were ever supposed to question whether this was Christ's return? Like this? No, no, no. Yeah, okay. So that's a certainty, right? And we yeah. know that because the Grand Inquisitor, who is the head of the Spanish Inquisition, the head of the Spanish Church, um, he saw from the crowd Christ bring a little girl back from the dead, right? So he knows. He's, there's no doubt in his mind. He knows exactly what's happening. And that sets the stage because then the Grand Inquisitor arrests Christ, who never speaks the whole time, brings him into jail, and then starts talking to him, sort of the way Ivan in this chapter is talking to Alyosha. Yes. Okay, so you see what I mean there? You see how that parallel exists? I mean, yeah, I was thinking, well, it, you set it up for me at the end of our last session, where you were like, notice how uh, Alyosha um, begins to win this argument, you know, or begins right. to and it immediately became clear to me that there was, that he's acting Christ-like yeah. in this context. Right. Okay. So I think at this point, I'll hand it off to you. So once again, for anyone who 
forgot or didn't watch the first video. This is Ben's first time reading these chapters. So we're getting sort of the first read through impression, which will be your experience as you're reading it for class. So go ahead, Benji, let loose. So my next uh, sort of note or theme that I drew up um, was that the, the parallel from sort of like uh, what's, what Christ is suggesting here is the potential for like the infinite, right? You know, like redemption, forgiveness, rebirth, etc., all at once, like the miracle of any of this uh, on a human level. And then immediately the sort of response uh, from the establishment in this circumstance being the church, basically being like, oh, this, there's potential for disorder. Right. Like actually what this what posterity uh, in in this religious in devotion in this religious context has given us is like rule over man order. Right. And, you know, um, the church now sitting at the head of, you know, 1500 years of devotion to this religion saying, no, actually, like you can't alter what you said in posterity, you can't alter your text. We actually sit at the, f the front of the, the surge of, uh, of what you gave us and we know better because it's not actually freedom. It's, it's order that we've produced based yep. on you know, this, your cause. Right. Um, and I thought this was a fascinating way to basically like um, be eternally contemporary, right? That like, that there's always the war against like, uh, you know, this is like religious truth and scientific truth, which he, he then, you know, brings up. It was, it was nice to be thinking on the fly because it, it's like, as the text cascaded, he would bring up themes that I was, you know, kind of drawing on. Like suddenly he would mention science explicitly. Yeah. The science would never offer the, the bread that, um, that religious bread. Uh, right. But it would offer bread bread. Yes. Right. So maybe we can segue into that. Right. So it's interesting what he does. Uh, so the Grand Inquisitor, as we said, just starts talking to the Christ character, um, talking at him, kind of, almost like he's unloading things he needed to get off his chest the same way Ivan is unloading over. Yeah, it's country. preconceived. He's like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm thinking this. Oh, fucking life. Yeah. And he's basically making a long, long form argument as to why the, the orthodoxy of the church needs to prevent you from coming back, Christ, and doing your thing again, because it would make people question the orthodoxy. He's like, you don't have a right to do this. Yeah. You came, you said your message, we build a church based on that foundation if you come again it'll shake the foundations up so there's the order disorder thing right yeah. and then he, he says like a secret right which is that the church in his opinion has been working for him right now the him that he's talking about is satan right and he says it's very strange what he says he says that the, the three greatest questions, the true miracle of the first time you were here, Christ, were those three questions posed to you in the desert by Satan, by him. He doesn't really mention him by name, right? But the, you can infer that. Um, and this is the temptation of Christ, which is a pretty big deal. And the three temptations are the temptation to turn stones into bread, right? Um, the temptation to jump off of a building, I believe it was, and be caught by angels if you're the true God, and that, that would prove that you're God's son, right? Because God would never just let his son die like that, apparently. It's prophesied that angels would catch you. But the, the problem there would be you're tempting God. And the third one was the temptation to rule over earth and bring God's kingdom to earth, but you'd be the earthly ruler, Chris. Um, and Dostoevsky sort of switches the interpretation, the traditional interpretation of all of these stories around through the Grand Inquisitor here, right? So 
to tie this back to what you said, the first story is the bread, right? The first temptation. And I mean, the classic line is man cannot live on bread alone, right? We probably all heard that at some point growing up. And it has something to do with like, you need more than physical sustenance. You need spiritual nourishment to be fulfilled in life. Like there's more than materialistic things. There's more than the beastly elements of existence, the animalistic parts of existence. Um, but Dostoevsky seems to twist that a little bit through Ivan, through the Grand Inquisitor, right? The Grand Inquisitor seems to be saying, hey, dummy, if you wanted to redeem all of mankind, you should have gave them bread. If you made bread for everybody, then you can ask of them virtue, right? Because yeah. people will follow that which feeds them, right? Yeah. So he doesn't take a very, um, what would you say, flattering view of human beings. He seems to think human beings are dumb lemmings who will just follow the people who offer them the most, right? <laughs> so based on that, I'm going to throw it back to you a little bit. Because yeah. I don't know if reading that the first time, how much of that resonates with you. Yes. Um, but I also want to know your thoughts about it. Right. So right. let's talk about that bread thing a little bit more. Well, a couple of things came up like right in that. One was one of the things I think he's suggesting has some, uh, some parallels to like modern leftist thinking, right? He's kind of, he says like, see who's a sinner once everybody has bread, right? And right. there's a bit of a, uh, um, uh, what's the expression? Um, of there's a, a quality of outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like, you know, there are all these, if you, if you remove some of the distinctions between disparity between people, you'll, uh, you'll see that like these sins are, are, you know, not so dramatic perhaps, or that, you know, even deeper that there's like further connection between that there's uh, further uni unity between people. Um, One second, sorry to interject. Did you pick up on the line? And the only reason I'm stopping you here is because it's exactly what you were just mentioning. I feel like Dostoevsky captures that principle in one line. Um, I'm not even going to try to, it, it had something to do with um, in, the, in these modern times, but he was talking about Russia in the 19th century. There is no, there are none guilty. There is only hunger or something like that. Yes, that's that actually, uh, thou, that's just what I, the only line I underline on that page. <laughs> thou thou know that the ages will pass and humanity will proclaim proclaim by the lips of their sages that there is no crime and therefore no sin, there is only hunger. Right. So right. what's interesting there is that people nowadays seem to think that that might be a, like a new phenomenon that people think right. along these lines, but it's at least 130 years old, 130, 140 years old, something like that. Yeah. Um, the fact that there will be parts of society that will I don't want to say excuse or rationalize, but the way that they will make sense of the fact that people are immoral will be to claim that it's because some need is being unfulfilled. Therefore, they're not acting in a way that you can hold them accountable. Yes. But if you were to feed them, then we could see who's moral and not moral. But you'd have to feed everybody first, right? Yes. So the Inquisitor is making that point, right? Totally. So anyway, sorry to interrupt. I just thought that was an interesting topical aside. No, it's perfect. That's, I mean, that was the primary thing that I drew from this, right? And I think sort of another bargain that he's kind of setting up here is the notion of, um, of justifying competition as itself the problem mm -hmm. and also perhaps the virtue that things should exceed our grasp, right? On a couple of fronts here right? Even that, like, that, um, you know, truth, or the sort of like, or Christ himself should yeah. kind of elude our grasp, right? I think he's kind of like, uh, making this case as part of the argument, right? That like, that, that as, as 
freedom has expanded and as, as society has become more complex, that Christ or Christ-like behavior has become more elusive and, you know, the sort of like reality of God has become more and more distant and more and more confusing and confounding to people. Yeah. So I thought it, all of that at once is like Jesus, that is a ball of wax. Yeah. Um, it's so fun. <laughs> I'll bring up this Hemingway quote real quick about Dostoevsky because I think you just had a moment of that. Hmm. He's like, I'm never, in, I'm paraphrasing. I don't understand how someone could write so badly it make you feel so deeply. <laughs> 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 Which is funny because the, the more you read of him, there's definitely, he's sloppy, right? Like he's not a, a stylist by any means. His like structures for like novels as a whole aren't the tightest, right? But there's like, there's moments of pure brilliance, right? Yeah. It, so his highs are higher for me than, than almost anybody else. Um, so maybe one thing that we could talk about is how, again, there's a lot of projection going on here through the character. Like there's Dostoevsky projecting the rational side of his personality onto Ivan and the spiritual side on the Alyosha with him mm -hmm. writing the book. But then there's the character Ivan projecting in a more traditional sense. Um, something about the way he would like to run the world onto the Grand Inquisitor because he doesn't agree to step back to rebellion for a second. If he doesn't agree with the architecture of existence, he's, he wants there to be a, a different blueprint. And the Grand Inquisitor is sort of saying the same thing. He, he wants to be the engineer of, of society. He, he wants the church to lead the flock um, in a way that he, he, that's his main criticism of Christ. So to go back to, to the last video, I made the claim that in rebellion, Ivan seems to rationally um, destroy a legitimate belief in the morality of God's creation, right? To him. And then in the Grand Inquisitor, he's going to try to tackle the morality of Christ, which we said is going to be a very strange thing because Christian or non-Christian, almost universally people think he was good, whether he was God, right? He was just a good dude. The things that he, like, love thy neighbor and love thy enemy, all that sort of stuff that we mentioned. Um, but Ivan, through the Grand Inquisitor, is making the argument that he's actually immoral because he's allowed by, by giving people freedom that they cannot handle. He's ensuring that many, if not most people, won't be able to live up to the task and will therefore suffer as a result. Whereas if he were just more clear and was willing to enslave them to some extent, they would suffer less. Therefore, Christ is immoral, right? Now, this is a complicated argument, right? So maybe let's think about how he's weaving that into this bread story. Again, he, Dostoevsky is twisting the traditional understanding of the bread, uh, the stone and the bread thing. It seems to me like the Grand Inquisitor and therefore Ivan is saying, hey, hey, Jesus, if you wanted people to find heaven through you, the kingdom of heaven, because no one gets to the kingdom of heaven except through you, those are your words, why don't you turn these stones into bread? If you could do it, and if in doing so, people would look to you without question as a Lord to be followed. And then in looking to you as the Lord to be followed would find the kingdom of heaven. Not turning stones into bread deprives them of the kingdom of heaven. Does that equation make sense? That line of reasoning? It does. So that's a, that's a complicated argument, right? 
Christ doesn't respond to it, so we have to sort of fill in the blanks. What is there a response to it? Well, I, I, I actually felt like there was a little bit of a, a riddled insult through that line, too, that it's like, if, if the price itself must be um, stones into bread, mm -hmm. which to me was like, uh, in all of these exchanges, like there's a gimmickry in that, right? That it's like, like, that's a sort of like, like, how do you do that magic trick, right? <laughs> that impresses the hoi polloi. You know, when, when in fact, like the miracle of like to, to weave back towards that metaphysical substrate that yeah. like, that there's anything at all, right. Yeah. That there's a place where he can be to turn a stone, like that he has to perform this, uh, this common trick, yeah. right. To go, okay. Like now are you guys ready to get on board? <laughs> yeah. Like I have to turn this stone into bread because you can relate with that. Yeah. Because maybe you can't relate with, you know, like the uh, ever-expanding limitless cosmos. Like that wasn't enough of a trick for you. Right. <laughs> um, and for me, that was sort of, it was another, another frame where he's going like, uh, intelligence in a given exchange is based on meeting the being where it is. Yeah. Right. Like, um, relate the you know, it, I think it also weaves a little bit of um, people being divisible to the level of the individual, right? Like everyone meets Christ on a certain, in, in this context, on, on, on their scale, right? Yeah. And he does a pretty, like, pretty good job with the miracles, right? Like, you know, especially like scaling up towards the, the miracle of the rebirth of the, the young girl, you know, right. like roses in her hand, right? Like that's, that's a big... Uh, like what more do you <laughs> yeah, like, that's, my, that's my grand uh, hurrah he's like I, I did miracles man like it's yeah. it's part of the story right um, so then I think it's, it's funny I think he goes a little bit further back too when he mentions Dante here it, it felt a little bit like like he was using Dante as kind of the like uh, the pop culture example of right. this stuff right he's sort of like using each time he's using relatability from mm -hmm. a uh, a sort of disparate level like up to a like Dante right we've all heard this this stuff you know <laughs> good catch by the way <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad I, I feel like you picked up on something important which is the first story the, the stones and the bread story is all about miracles right later on in the chapter he says, let me see here. there are three powers. This is, again, the Inquisitor talking to Christ. Mm -hmm. Three powers, three powers alone, able to conquer and to hold captive forever the conscience of these infinite rebels. So those are people, infinite rebels, because of course yeah. they've the apple, they've rebelled against existence as Ivan had. Right. Um, for their happiness, these forces are miracle, mystery, and authority. <laughs> All right, those three words, miracle, mystery, and authority. Each of the three temptations, the Grand Inquisitor is going to try to address how his way satisfies those three needs in a way that Christ's manner of operating did not. And if he came back again and stayed, would not, because he would just do the same thing again and would undo what the inquisitor thinks the church is doing so the the bread thing is like you want people to believe give them a miracle and they'll believe like what's so hard about that dude right yeah the second story the second temptation is more complicated perhaps right i feel like we might have to work this out because i always find myself sort of stuck in the weeds on it is christ's refusal to jump off of some height and be caught by angels and the traditional response is like you don't you don't tempt god right um and the inquisitor's logic seems to be very similar to the stone to bread story to some extent it was like well you want people for some reason to believe 
freely. You want to give them the freedom to believe or not believe. And you want them to believe in you because, well, for what, right? He's, he's saying you're asking them. You could have proven it here, right? Like if you would just jump off of a cliff or a tall building and be caught by angels for everyone to see, everyone would follow you. Everyone would be all in. They would have no doubt. But that would resolve the mystery, right? He's saying you left the mystery there and we're going to be the keepers of the mystery and just ask them to believe based on blind faith alone. Um, and that'll be fine for them. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that particular aspect. Well, yeah, I mean, I just basically appreciate, like, here's a great level of, of this kind of conversation, like a, a, a roadblock for probably 95% of us in our conversations about the notions of faith mm. is like, if it hinges upon like something, um, something in reality showing up, right? Like Jesus coming back or an actual miracle, right? Or, you know, like, you know, all, all of these sort of notions like of he is risen kind of Christianity of going like, okay, we can't really talk beyond this point because yeah. we're conflating religious and, and scientific truths. Mm -hmm. but, like, I love that he's like, okay, like I'll give you <laughs> that you don't, that you don't want to come back or that like, you don't want to have to come back yeah. to show this, that you, you almost want to like request the minimum barrier of entry mm -hmm. into belief being blind, blind faith. Right. You know, I, I, I love that he's kind of like, he's, he's, um, uh, he's like forfeiting that territory to the argument. He's like, I don't even, I don't even need that. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just appreciate that being framed in it because it's like, it's a beautiful way of approaching doubt, um, you know, or sort of allowing a, a certain level, a certain um, margin of error being like doubt imbued in a, uh, a faith. Yeah. And then to go along with this, this faith element, I, I really do believe Dostoevsky is taking to heart um, Milton's line that, um, <laughs> My wife's talking upstairs. I don't know if it's, not, it doesn't, it's not too loud. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, she's on the phone with someone that she works with, I guess. Um, that God created man sufficient to stand, but free to fall. Right. Like I think that that's the principle that the grand inquisitor is accusing the Christ figure of upholding, which would make sense if he's, the son of God and being about the family business, right? That he would still uphold the same ethos. Um, and the grand inquisitor, like Ivan is like, well, the person who is sufficient to stand, but free to fall and figures out how not to fall is better than the person who had, who had the net, you know, like for the reason that if you see someone walking a tightrope with no net, it's more thrilling. It's better than someone walking a tightrope with a net. Like you're not that impressed because what, whatever. Um, right. It's like Christ is asking us to operate without a net because the highs are higher, but the lows are lower. And the Grand Inquisitor is like, that's not fair because not everyone's, not everyone can do that. So you are dooming people to, to what? He doesn't say hell, but yeah. is that implied there? Like, at least to suffering, right? Yeah, certainly to suffer. Um, and so then clearly there's projection going on here, right? Yeah. Because who is the one in the book so far who is suffering because the answer isn't clear to him? It's Ivan, right? Yeah. I, Ivan is suffering because he's fallen. He's... He's thought things through to the human limit of reason. He, he finds existence lacking. 
Um, and because of that, he suffers. And you can almost feel Ivan grieving through the Inquisitor, crying out to Christ to be like, well, just make the answer clear so, so we don't suffer. Because then the last story, the last temptation, is just become the Caesar of all the lands. Like he takes him up into the height. I forget what mountain it's supposed to be. Some place apparently where you can see the whole world. And he says, just Satan says in the original biblical story, I can make you king of all of this. So you can have all earthly power. And Christ rejects that right now. In the biblical account, that's supposed to be a reflection of Christ's personality, right? Like he doesn't want temporal, earthly power or authority over people in that way. Um, and that's supposed to be a virtue, right? The Grand Inquisitor is saying, how dare you not be the king of kings who you are supposed to be and lead your followers to the promised land, um, to the kingdom of heaven, in the sense that, let me think how to phrase this exactly, in the sense that people are weak and won't be able to existentially handle thinking through existence to the degree Ivan has. But some people can do it. And those people, he's saying, since you're not doing it, Christ, we, the church, we will be the keepers of the truth. The truth being that existence is not worth having faith in for Ivan and the Grand Inquisitor. Yeah. But we will spin that for the people to keep them ignorant but happy. In other words, the Grand Inquisitor and they're still toying around with, this whole thing toys around with the Eden story, eating the apple, the loss of innocence. The Grand Inquisitor is saying sort of, let's push people back into the garden. Let's uneat, let's have them uneat the apple by becoming less conscious, conscious mm. right? We will take the burden of consciousness, of self-awareness and the awareness of good and evil but we're doing it for the benefit of the masses who can't handle that. So back to the garden you go. Right. But back to eternal childhood also. Yes. Right. And then perhaps, well, what is the alternative? Um, the alternative is, is like, well, once you've jumped in the river, you might as well keep swimming to the other side. Right. Which is sort of, what he's saying, what the Grand Inquisitor, what Ivan is saying, the Grand Inquisitor is saying, Christ is asking of people. Right. Which is too hard for them. It's too hard to keep eating the apple, but maturing, psychologically maturing to the point where you can forgive all for all of its suffering, knowing good and evil, but forgiving it and embracing it and loving it. But that's too much. Too yes. much. Okay. Well, I, I, mean, I think he's connecting back to rebellion here at the end, too. He's sort of like intentionally belaboring his point that he's, he's unwilling. He was unwilling to make the exchange for, for one suffer for all. Mm -hmm. And he's still unwilling to make the exchange at like a, a, a cloistered few thousand yeah. You know, doing the, having the knowledge and having the, the sort of control and it, like, he's like, I'm not willing to make it at the scale of one and I'm not willing to make it at the scale of like these, these sects of, right. uh, of, you know, um, flavors of the weak kind of gods, yeah. right? Like it's, it, it's a uh, unification of all and a, um, a sort of like uh, equation that uh that zeroes out mm -hmm. or it's nothing right and you know I, I actually feel like there's subtext in that of the the stone to bread suggestion again like drawing that back to 
to Christ where he's going like, like actually the, the same sort of miracle that stone to bread is like God to Christ is because in this context, Christ is like, what's up dudes? Like I'm, I'm a human God, you know, like I've got a beard. I wear the, the fashion of the day. Like you guys know me. And he's like, nah, man, like same gimmick, you know, like it's, it's just, and even the way that we discussed, you know, notions of, of, what people ascribe to human Christ, right? Going like, I mean, universally, like pretty good dude. Like, you know, <laughs> decent ideas. Yeah. Like it wasn't the fire and brimstone, you know, it was yeah. like, um, and I see him going to all of this, like, no, it, it's just another version of the thing. You know, it might be a little bit more like scaled to reach the suburbs, you know, like yeah. might be more prepared to like, uh, you know, um, be drawn out across a few more people, but the same, you know, like um, dichotomy is being spread where a small amount of people have power, right. control. Uh, the not- elect, as, as the Grand Inquisitor calls them, right? Yes. And he's, he's combining those who are in control with those who are also saved because they are fulfilling somehow um, Christ's covenant. Yes. Right. Okay. So sorry to interrupt. No, that that was perfect time to jump in. I mean, the other, the only addition that I would make is that this notion of like freely, freely relinquished power or freedom in the name of this is kind of like drawn along with it. Right. That like part of, part of that bargain is like, no, these, these people are actually so eager to give up, you know, they want to give up their freedom. Like yes. they, don't, they don't want the freedom. Like that's where you're, oh, he, he's sort of like Christ. You must not know people at all. Yeah, right? <laughs> you've been seeing these guys. People more than anything want. This is the Grand Inquisitor talking. Some lord to give up their freedom to, right now. This I think is clear projection. I think this is why Freud loved this book so much. Um, because the Freudian interpretation of it is Ivan seems like he's, he wants there to be a God he can believe in and trust so badly that in this poem he's concocted in his head, he's created this, this inquisitor figure who is essentially Lord of all on earth and who is functioning as a benevolent dictator. Like he wants there to be, a dictator but he wants it to be this type of dictator as opposed to the lord from the story with the dogs and rebellion right yeah. and that's sort of perhaps what he thinks the world is actually structured as but he would prefer this this craving for for order and stability right. and it and uh, what protection from he wants like a bubble wrapped life for most people. It's yeah. Like. And w- well, in his mind, Christ offers the opposite of that. Cause it seems like, cause this, again, to take it back to Alyosha, when Alyosha said, I want to suffer too. Yeah. This is to Dostoevsky. It seems like this is, Christ is God's expression of, hey, I want to suffer too. Um, I will suffer as you suffer. And then we will all look at the suffering through, through a personified God. You can see how the human being, with all of its limitations, can stare the suffering right in the eye and forgive it. Yeah. And that's what, however this is supposed to work. <laughs> I don't know. That's, if you can do that, you are God. If you can, and this might be the problem. I've been saying, you gave us nothing to follow except for you as a figure of imitation. To imitate you is to be God, and none of us are gods, so you set the bar too high. Yeah, 
and if the bar to to living life without unnecessary suffering is to be God, then we will all suffer. And how dare you do that? Yep. When you could have done otherwise. And it's like, whoa, okay, I'm <laughs> right. I see. Well, it's a, this was he's trying to, to force the issue that this was a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, if this is the framework and yeah. all is possible, yeah. it could have been different. Yeah. You know, like it, it's that's about as close to rebellion. Uh, he's making the case for, for rebellion at this point, yeah. you know, where like at the end he was like, if you think that's rebellion, like get a load of this. <laughs> <laughs> you thought my criticisms of the metaphysical nature of existence were, were bad. Yeah. <laughs> Watch me he's, almost at his, real quick. <laughs> he's at his like peak like classically russian yeah uh, and and peak like he's like rabbi ivan at this point you know <laughs> he's like <laughs> oh man and then and then let's just let's get to the big thing i don't know if you got to it so maybe i'll have to this might be a decent spot to pause okay. um, because we're like an hour deep and I'd, I'd really like to give it um, like a, an appropriate okay. read. Yeah, um, this deserves two sessions. Yeah. Yeah, and um, the ending, there's so much to to talk about because we haven't talked about how, we haven't talked about Alyosha during this at all. Right. right. Alyosha's sort of been questioning what the hell Ivan's doing with this poem. Like what sense, wh where's this poem going? What the hell's going on? And then, but I, I told you that, at least in Dostoevsky's mind, Alyosha wins the argument right? without saying a word. But Alyosha said a lot of words in the chapter, but none of them, none of them do anything to Ivan's argument. Um, so you'll see what I mean. That uh, I think that'll be coming up very soon for you. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll stop this right here for the listeners. Um, thanks for watching, folks. Uh, Tune in for the next one, and adios.